Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, don't forget to uh, uh, sign your attendance, and I will share the, the, the link on the chat. And um, Gordon Kennedy will start his lesson. We've got a little bit <laughs> problems <laughs> with the PC uh, computer. Okay. Um, yeah, I I don't know what's happened today, um, but I can't I can't get the video to work, which is which is weird because it was working the other day. So um, I'll have to I'll have to have a look at that. But there's been an update of the of the program, so um, it could be so it could be something to do with that. So uh, as ever, I'll have to have a look. Okay. Um, so. Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope uh, I hope everyone is okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Actually, I'm going to switch my since the video is not working. I'm going to switch the video stream off be, for me because um, uh, it doesn't really matter. Oh, come on. Uh, okay, right, let's see if that works. And now I'm going to open the I'm going to open the, my desktop, okay? So just two seconds and it should come up. Okay, here we go. This chair is, <laughs> my chair is collapsing, which is probably just as well that you can't see me on the video. Okay, right. Um, so if we have a look at this, uh, just to sort of see where we are in this progression of things, um, quite clearly uh, things are a little bit about, a little bit out of sync now because we are looking at. Uh, sustainable cities and transport and stuff, um, and I wanted to I wanted to f to have a I wanted to finish that this evening because we are we, last time we started talking about transition towns, um, and so I wanted to I wanted to finish this part uh, this evening because I think it pulls together a number of uh, a number of uh, ideas. Um, so the next session, which is the 13th of December, and then there's the 20th of December, um, I actually want to use these two these two sessions to sort of bring together <coughs> a number of different uh, a number of different pieces. So um, the interconnectivity I'm going to push further back because I think it's better to bring that towards the uh, bring that in towards the end because it it's the thing which underlines uh, or which underpins all of this um, all of these uh, all of these topics let's say so I'm not too worried that we're a little bit out of uh, out of um, off the plan um, because I think I think that there's some uh, margin for mod modification here so Okay, so if if anyone if everyone's okay, um, we're going to I'm going to move on to uh, carry on talking about um, the tr the topic of transition towns um, and transition cities, which we started last time. Now, um, okay, so we we talked about where this transition idea came from. Um, and the <clears throat> the whole thing is the transition is to do with um, moving away from oil and fossil fuels, quite simply put. Um, but this is in a this is in a context which obviously um, is becoming increasingly uh, increasingly more complex. And when the when the original ideas of um, of transition as as an initiative were first, let's say first uh, mooted uh, back in the back in the early 90s, um, the let's say the the idea of climate change 
for most people was not uh, was not on the horizon. Um, for those who were maybe more um, involved in either um, the oil industry or the uh, uh, involved in environmental uh, work dealing with uh, climate and also those who were involved in climate science itself um, could maybe foresee something which was happening, something things which were coming. Um, for most people it just basically wasn't really on our radar. Um, so the the transition town idea was really to do with the idea of peak peak oil, which was this idea that um, at some point in the relatively near future the oil upon which basically modern um, modern society um, uh, runs <coughs> was going to become scarce and so that would require thinking about um, how to address this in different ways but above all in um, thinking about how towns or cities or places where we live could adapt in order to maintain their viability and remain uh, and be sustainable uh, going forward into the future. Okay, so the the whole thing, the transition that's re that refer refers to here, uh, that it refers to, is this transition away from fossil fuels. So in a way, it's sort of quite um, prescient in the sense that it's foreseeing a future which has now, here you know, we're talking 35, 30 years later, um, or 25 years later, we're now sort of uh, actually at the point where we have to, we have no choice. Um, we have to make some transition away from fossil fuels and so the question uh, there's a whole, s a whole set of questions that this obviously raises okay so this was the idea of the of the transition towns uh, we talked about where they came from they started off in Totnes not Tottenham uh, this is down in place down in Devon um, we said that there are a number of these places, a number of towns which are divide, which um, define themselves as transition towns across the whole of the world, actually, um, including places which you might not um, you might not associate uh, with such an initiative. Um, the there, there are uh, examples of transition towns in, in, in places like India, um, and I think this is this is cu well curious. This is this is interesting because it, it illustrates the how the let's say the core values of the uh, of the transition initiative or the transition movement are um, going beyond simply. Uh, making towns which are uh, more livable, or you, know, uh, um, you drive where you, you you drive less and there's more car sharing. It's a lot more than just that, and I think that's why um, the idea of uh, of transitioning is uh, is much broader than simply, let's say, saving energy and reducing oil usage. So, um, and in fact, uh, it can be as valid for a town in Europe, uh, a developed town in Europe, as it could be for a local community in a rural setting in, um, uh, in places like India or wherever, uh, in which the problems are, there may still be the problems of excess traffic passing through pollution um, and for example one of the key things for uh, that type of context is access to reliable energy sources so um, so the transition town network is is big it's broad it's expanding the ideas are um, let's say catching on um, and so what we can say is that uh, the transition initiative is trying to get 
people to think about um, change, think about changes for themselves. And I think I finished last time on this, um, which was this uh, this poll. Um, it wasn't commissioned by The Guardian, but this was reported by The Guardian just last week or the week before. Um, and it's the, the poll is interesting because if you remember um, what people are prioritizing is our actions which are already happening okay but the the actions that we really need to happen are the actions which people are well saying that they don't they don't consider them so important okay and i i made this comment here and i will come back to this at some point in a in a later in a later session when we bring when i will try to bring the, the various threads together um that people really do not understand the uh um the role of, of carbon dioxide in um in all of this because although it's true there are other greenhouse gases and we will meet them at some point um, the one which is by far and away the most important is carbon dioxide because it's the one which is produced the most um, so it's true methane is uh, is more potent as a as a, a greenhouse gas um, and it's true that there is a, that it has a certain, let's say, uh, there's a certain impact because it is being produced and it is being produced on a very large scale. However, um, most of most of the change is going to have to come from reducing uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere if we want to have a climate which is um amenable to uh human civilization now i didn't say um <laughs> amenable to human life because human life can uh, can actually uh carry on in many different uh, types of climate uh, including extreme extreme climates so you only have to think of uh, the Tuareg uh, living in Sahara in the Sahara or the Inuit living in the in the high Arctic um, but the point is that most most people do not live in those situations and the those the cultures the groups of people who live in those those situations and the cultures which they have developed are inherently um, based on how the group can survive in really rather extreme conditions so um, let's just say that that's not for everybody of course so okay so the point here is that um, people don't want to travel less they particularly in Europe um, over the last 20 years or so 30 years or so I think um, uh, low-cost airlines have uh, been a big promoter of let's say the European um, the European dream of uh, of people coming together um, I think uh, but it what this what this is what this data tells us is that people don't want to travel any less they still want to do this um, people are not willing to change their food they're not willing to favor public transport over cars okay um, they're not willing to reduce the heat of the, the the temperature in their houses and put on an extra jumper um, they're not willing they're not particularly willing to uh, to ban petrol cars um, they're not willing to even slightly turn vegetarian Okay, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of basically people uh, seem to be um, unwilling to give up uh, give up these rather um, rather bad habits, <coughs> which uh, which lead to a lot of uh, a lot of production of CO2, and so 
I suppose this is this is where 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 we are at now. Um, we're going we are going to have to really look in the mirror at some point and really ask ourselves the questions. Um, okay, so um, I think one of the uh, one of the things here though is that if we're going to make changes, and I think I think we are talking about uh, quite uh, quite big. Um, quite big life t lifestyle changes for some people. Um, the the big changes are, have are happening, or the changes that are happening on a large scale, are the um, are being driven by the let's say the the science of the thing, which is that we that the CO2 is um, the CO2 is is the is the motor for for the for the warming effect um, and with the consequence of the increased energy in the system and the consequence of the increasingly irregular um, and chaotic uh, weather patterns which that um, which that produces as the energy in the system tries to balance itself out okay um, so that's really big and it's extremely abstract um, the transition town movement is actually about um, taking this big thing and acknowledging that it is big, um, but bringing bringing things down to a more human level, such that um, uh, such that we can overcome the uh, the sense of well, s sense of helplessness in a way, because if you think, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I certainly sometimes feel um, it doesn't matter what you do as an individual. Um, I have no control over the, the the CO2 levels. I have no control over most of these things. So, uh, what little can I do? And I think here, I think this is where you 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 sort of have to remember that every little bit of every little uh, helps. So every little thing that you can do will um, will can can contribute. Um, whether that is from um, reduce using your bicycle a little bit more, reducing your use of the car, going on public transport, um, recycling. Um, eating meat once a week rather than twice a week, whatever. Okay, um, but of course, uh, of course, feeling helpless about something also um, engenders uh, feelings of uh, fear, because the the future is ex because it seems to have suddenly become extremely uncertain. So. Um, those of you, those of us who were young adults in the 1990s and year 2000s, um, maybe we remember that there were times of it seemed like everything was okay and everything was just ticking over. But now it seems like everything is uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fear and despair around, a lot of anger, um, a sense of impotence. What can you do? Or I don't believe it, and it's when you say it's not my problem, it's someone else's problem. The government should do this; they should do whoever they are. Um, this is this is one of the one of the key one of the key things here that we we only have <laughs> we we are all in it because we're on this planet. Um, and pushing the problem around is not really going to work because the problem is just going to go around the corner, but it's still there. So um, I think the, uh, the 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 key message from the, the transition movement has been uh, this idea that um, oil is, let's say, at the um, at the centre of all of this. Now. Oil in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way we use it. Um, oil, if you remember from a much earlier session uh, before the summer, is essentially um, fossilized sunlight in the sense that 
um, it comes from trees and uh, forests which grew uh, millions of years ago and which over time have been converted into um, by different biochemical and uh, degradation process chemical de degradation processes have been converted into um, petrol the the petrol uh, materials that we know now um, it's I think it's interesting that um, the world didn't actually have to go this way in the sense that historically uh, oil w oil came on the scene at a time when cities were expanding rapidly in the late 1800s um, and up until the the development of the small let's say personal um, combustion engine able to uh, able to drive a small personalized car um, people were using horse-drawn transport now um, none of us none of us have ever lived in a city which only has horse-drawn transport and certainly not a big city um, and I think it's curious, it's interesting to, to to ponder this for a little for for a couple of minutes because horse drawn transport is not exactly um, not exactly the easiest thing to manage for a city because if you think that every horse produces um, something like ten kilos, if not more, of um, material solid waste every day. Okay, uh, and in a big city, I think now the, the numbers I read were somewhere like Boston in the US had something like 100,000 horses in the city at any, in a, in any one time. That's a, that's a lot of um, solid waste every day. Uh, you also have to feed them. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole, there's a, there was a whole, let's say, uh, there was a whole economy based around managing horses as, a, as the, let's say, the, the, the source of power, as the engines of the um, uh, of the city, and so of course uh, the internal combustion came along, internal combustion engine came along, uh, the horseless carriage, and this was a huge improvement because you no longer had all of this uh, waste material everywhere. You didn't have dead horses in the streets because that was also sometimes what happened um, quite a lot actually um, and so there's a whole set of uh, a whole set of things which meant that um, uh, which meant that the let's say the the, the the place was ripe for the moment was ripe for something which could replace the horse but it didn't actually have to be um, it didn't actually have to be oil. What happened was that um, the first vehicles were actually electric. The only problem is, and this is something that we know now, and we know not only with hindsight but also because uh, not much development has been done in the meantime. Now a lot of development has been done over the last 20-30 years, but in the meantime between the late 1800s and early 1990s Electri electrical vehicles and electrical motors and what have you were used in very particular situations um, but the very first vehicles in towns were actually electric um, the problem was that it didn't fit the um, it didn't fit the model of um, how would you describe well, it didn't ba it basically didn't fit the capitalist model okay um, because it required, uh, so for example, there were car sharing, electric car sharing or electric taxi sharing schemes in places like Philadelphia and New York and uh, Boston uh, already by the by the early uh, by the late 1800s, early 1900s. But these were completely um, these were completely uh, abandoned because they became economically uh, unsustainable with the arrival of cheap petrol and cheap petrol came on the scene because of Rockefeller who had the uh, who had the, the vision 
to um, to basically integrate integrate the supply chain, um, creating a monopoly and a huge fortune at the same time. Okay, so we've got this dependence on oil, um, and in in many ways, uh, in many ways, we we we, we find it hard to. Uh, if we ever think about it, we find it hard to imagine a world without oil. Um, it, if you just look around you, even though you may not be in a car, if you are in a car, it's okay. you've got the engine and you're moving. Um, but you look around you, all of this plastic, it, all of this stuff, it's all oil. It's all coming from oil somehow. Um, the medicines that you take, a lot of the medicines are made from oil derivatives. Um, now, obviously, that's specialty chemicals. It's a very particular thing, and it's for the most part, it's quite uh, it's quite positive. But um, it's like all things; you can have positive parts and negative parts. So, if we look at the, if we think about the, um, uh, if we think about the, the the effects on on how you feel about things on your psychology. Um, it, having a, a belief that the future is going to be okay <laughs> is actually uh, quite important and ha and being anxious over uh, what's where things are going what's happening um, the direction that things are taking is obviously not very good for for people it's not very good for people so um, a cure, well, not a curious thing, but uh, something which happened 2008, um, which was obviously not foreseen by the transition people, and it was not, um, it wasn't really part of the, let's say, the the thing which is underlying the transition uh, movement, but it did expose the vulnerability of. Um, it did expose uh, how vulnerable uh, local communities can be to events uh, on the other side of the world. So this again, this is something which uh, you, you you're 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 doing something, and you're living and working in a particular place, and then something on the other side of the world uh, done by people you've never heard of. Um, suddenly has a, a major effect on you and this is just an example of uh, how interconnected uh, things in the modern world are but as far as a, a local community is concerned or as far as a, a town is concerned um, this is a, these are events which happen and which uh, in some way the um, you need to uh, you need to have resilience, and this is the word that we're using here: resilience to be able to um, to be able to uh, weather, as we say, weather these storms. So um, part of this now, I was I was thinking about what I was saying here, and um, I don't want it to sound like it's a sort of um, uh, like a <laughs> some sort of uh, rant about uh, uh, the economy and what have you, because uh, it's but it's clear that underneath a lot of this there is uh, it's economic activity. Um, so if we're talking about the growth of oil, we're talking about the growth of oil because it's energy. It's it's an energy currency which is transport, which can be used in many different situations, and that allows people to do more things across the economy in order to um, create more economy, because this is all, uh, this, is, this is capitalism in a way. Okay, so there is, a, there is an inexorable economic growth, which is being uh, promoted, although, as most people will, Realise there are there are no things in nature which grow continuously without stopping and pausing. Things may live for a, for a thousand years. 
the bristlecone pines, for example, um, they live for over a thousand years, but um, they're not constantly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and so this 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 growth is always being predicated on the use of energy, and since the industrial revolution with the development of the steam engine and the mechanization of of labor um, this has sort of gone hand in hand with a um, an increase in the efficiency of the of the of the of the technology technologies which are used for getting the energy out of the uh, out of the uh, out of its different sources, and typically, of course, this uh, this is the economic um, the ec economic gains or the returns go to few, with uh, most people not uh, not getting very much at all, if anything. So um, the idea of transition, because this is actually what we're talking about, and maybe I lost myself a little bit. Um, the idea of transition is that. Um, it does actually challenge what economic growth actually means. Um, so, one of the one of the things is to um, it doesn't say it doesn't say to to stop doing global things, but it does say to um, make local more important again. Okay. Um, and the proposal over time has been that by cutting down on the use of fossil fuels or the, the fossil fuel dependence, um, this can actually be advantageous for communities and the people who uh, who live in them. Okay. Now, um, this is uh, this is curious. Well, this is interesting because I find it interesting because it's a um, it, it's something which reflects, let's say, the human side of the human side of things, which for many, 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 many years has been completely, um, which has been completely ignored or completely, yes, uh, left, uh, left to one side, uh, simply for economic reasons. Um, and as they say, um, you know. Was, the, was it uh, <laughs> John Paul uh, and um, uh, Ringo said that uh, money can't buy me love, so it's not necessarily going to make me uh, make you happy. Okay, so um, where does this transition stuff come from? It comes from the bottom, um, and that's one of the key one of the key aspects of it because it's not from um, it's not from above it's not from the pa it's not from the from governments it's actually coming from from communities it's coming from lo groups of local people and uh, this is a quote from uh, someone who has been involved in the uh, in the organization uh, the transition initiative um, and it's because the the grassroots, the local people, you and I, we we are local people in our local context. Um, we have our we have our concerns about things, and let's say the the, the big ideas of the politics. Quite often, it's, it it means nothing at the local level. So, the transition initiative is based very much on um, action happening from from the bottom from bottom upwards okay and so um, working as an individual um, you can only get so far um, but if you have a group of individuals who are working in a community this can actually drive uh, it can drive change in the community um, and this is the uh, this is uh, this is a key thing for the transition initiatives. It's about self-organisation. So it's about 
uh, community groups who are interested and who are wanting to um, change things in the community or improve things in the community. It's about inst it's about these groups instead of waiting for someone to perhaps provide a solution that's not actually um, that's not actually suitable because there are many examples of solutions provided by ex people external to the to a local context and the solution is is not adequate um, it's also <coughs> it's also uh, about um, not necessarily waiting around because uh, I've just well just saw some examples over the last uh, the last few days. Now these were actually big initiatives in the UK, which have been uh, which have been cancelled or which have been changed, um, and people waiting for these things to happen. Um, if you just keep waiting, uh, the, the, these things may or may not happen according to the whims of the of the central government. So. Um, being able to, let's say, uh, bring about change from the bottom up in your own community is uh, is obviously much more advantageous because you um, you can you can control the change. You can take the change forward yourselves. Okay, so um, I quite like this one: buy local or buy by local, because it's true, and I think everyone has the there is the tension of uh, of Amazon. <laughs> okay, um, now uh, I don't think you should necessarily feel guilty uh, for for using the service, but at the same time, um, if you can, if there's a way of supporting the local economy, uh, that may be uh, may be may be better. Um, so, what are the transition? What are the the three R's of the transition? One is resilience. Um, one is um, relocalization. So, um, this this may seem like a bit of a strange word, but it's um, it's very much about um, trying to build feedback circles, feedback loops within the local. Um, within within the local context, um, and it's also there's also an element of, of promoting um, development which regenerates, uh, which is regenerating uh, aspects of the local uh, of the local economy or of the local situation. No, it's not just economics; this it's also the local situation. So, if we look at uh, if we look at resilience, first of all, um, an ability to recover from or adjust easily to a misfortune or a change. So, in this context, uh, the ability of a system, which is an individual, an economy, a town, or a city, to withstand a shock from the outside. So, in a way, uh, I think this this phrase here is prob probably says it better because it's it's not that you want to have resilience you want to be resilient okay and it's the de desired state so that when stuff does happen uh, you're able to cope with it and this is an ability of a system an individual okay an economy a town or a city or a community so this is the uh, this is the idea of being able to withstand changes which are happening and as we know changes are happening now the change could be anything from a physical uh, a physical extreme weather event to a um, an economic event where factories are closing etc etc um, so the uh, part of the transition thinking is that it's better to plan than be surprised um, and Interestingly enough, I think there's an element of uh, there's an element of sc scenario uh, planning here, because um, people uh, you can you can plan you can plan for a future, um, but you have to be careful not to be drawn into what you hope will be 
the uh, the outcome. And so um, being able to look at reason reasonable hypotheses, reasonable scenarios of what could happen um, is uh, is a useful way of um, uh, is a useful way of looking at uh, looking at this in order to concentrate your energies on particular things. Um, the other uh, the other aspect here is this idea of um, the local solution will be just as big as the local problem. Um, you're not necessarily creating a new movement which is going to uh, sweep the country or whatever. No, it's, it's very much about acting in a in a local uh, in a local um, context and acting to uh, strengthen the resilience of the local community. Okay, relocalization means um, promoting the idea of meeting local core needs locally. So, for example, thinking about food, um, or, or we're thinking about food, um, materials, energy, as far as possible. Now, this is, this is interesting because um, I think I think in most places these days we uh, we've seen the rise of um, farmers markets, um, but in some places they never actually went away. So I'm just thinking about here uh, in uh, in Verona. There's there are lots of markets, and there, for, as, for as long as I have been here, um, there there are lots of markets all over the city. In different places every day, um, and many many people just shop in the local markets. This is not necessarily true in other countries, though. Um, and the uh, quite often the um, these local markets give uh, give space to local producers uh to sell their uh, sell their materials so um we have the so called uh, zero kilometer uh food which is a which is uh local cooperatives selling um uh, selling food from local farmers etc cetera, etc cetera. this can be extended to other things um as far as energy is concerned this is a curious one because we don't think of um we, t we don't tend to think of energy regeneration as being a potentially local thing. Yeah, you could have, you, it could be very local in the sense that you could have um, solar panels on your on your on your ha on the roof of your house, but that's just for you usually. Um, however, there are there are sort of there are some. Um, some initiatives which uh, again it d does depend on the country that you live you live in um, but there are some initiatives where neighborhoods for example are heated by um, burning uh, by incinerating waste at high temperature uh, I know that this happens in some places in Germany for example um, and it's part of the let's say the the um, the circle of closing the circle on the uh, on the waste in uh, on, on the waste management in some cities, um, in other places there are uh, cogeneration schemes where you are using biomass, local biomass. These are things which you couldn't scale up to a huge scale. It's not like having a nuclear power, a huge nuclear power station, which is producing gigawatts of, of electricity. Um, these things are much more local. Um, but even even then, just the other day, I read something about um, uh, small nuclear power stations, like the size of a the size of a container truck, which sounds pretty. Uh, science fictiony, um, but apparently these are being being developed as we speak, and they they are there will be some testing soon. And these things are capable of again heating a providing energy for a neighbourhood in a uh, in a town. Whether they are desirable to have around, that's a different uh, that's a different matter. Okay, so um, what's the whole thing here? The whole thing is and. 
it's not being insular. It's not closing. It's not. We're not going back to the days of the communes in the Medi in the Middle Ages. No, it's just it's just this idea of um, let's say um, rather than looking for something across the other side of the world, maybe you have it just around the corner. Um, okay, so the idea of the regenerative uh, development. So. Um, the idea here is to um, is to develop the community and uh, to develop the community such that it's not um, it's not relying on something like oil, which is becoming more and more scarce. So we need to we're weaning off weaning ourselves off this uh, off this. Um, of this dependence, okay, so many people feel uh, that individual action is too trivial to be effective, as, as I said before, what can I as an individual actually do? Um, at the same time, you may feel that you're not actually able to influence anything at all at a governmental level. If you think about the, oh, I'm just thinking about the Italian situation and the sorts of the sorts of things that you hear at the uh, at the political level there's nothing there's no there's no substance to anything so um if people are even paying attention to this type of thing okay so that brings us to this idea of the scale and the scale is important here because it's the idea of being trapped between, as we say uh, in English, uh, between a rock and a hard place, which is um, being caught in the middle of two things. If it's such that, if the situation is such that I can't, my vote doesn't matter, Okay, I feel that the political, uh, let's say, the political mechanisms are such that my vote doesn't matter, um, or I feel that as an individual, an individual, I can't do anything. Um, I'm feeling pretty helpless. Um, but the scale that Kirkpatrick Sale uh, um, proposed is the idea of the community, and it's this idea of um, so. Instead of instead of just trying to do everything on your own, you actually work with other people, but you work with other people at a at a at a local at a local level. So um, the transition initiative is working at the scale of the community, um, and it's this level where personal actions. Are significant, and this is this. I think this is. It sounds sort of relatively, relatively straightforward. But I think if we reflect on it, um, this is the this is the level where things are important because action is important because people see you act, and they they see you do things, and they will do things too. And so, personal action becomes significant and visible. And it can also be effective because you can actually see the result of what you uh, of what you um, of what you do. So, uh, so I, I mean, just think uh, if I think about how big am I? Am I uh, about 180 centimeters tall? Um, maybe a little bit more. I don't know. Maybe a little bit less with old age. Um, at a government at a government level, I'm a, I'm an X on a ballot paper if I if I have a vote. Um, whereas at a community level, you are actually part of the local uh, the local geography, so you're actually part of the uh, the local um, uh, the local scene, if you like. Okay, um, there are also uh, other types of scales which we can consider and I thought this was rather curious when I when I was looking at the uh, gathering the materials about the transition towns um, I came across this uh, this these considerations which are around the um, uh, how scale affects morality and so we talk about economies of scale but we never think about morality and 
if we look at individuals, well, uh, individuals are extremely varied. varied. You can be a hero, you can be uh, a total um, <coughs> a total unhero, let's say. Um, but there's you, but usually within you know within the individual, you are there's a constraint. Um, and you're always constrained by size. You are still only an individual. Um, on a national scale, on a really large scale, we know that uh, the morality can take really quite disastrous, uh, disastrous uh, directions. But at the community level, <coughs> at the community level, we are in a much more complex area. Um, so communities can be like people um, they can be jealous and spiteful and closed and uh, not particularly open to uh, to <coughs> to new things um, but it's less powerful than a state simply because it's smaller um, and communities also contain many many more reasons for people to identify with them because it's part of our, let's say, everyday reality. So, what does this, what does this, what does this really mean? It means that um, if there is a sense of community, if there's a sense of community identity, you can identify more strongly with that than perhaps at the more abstract um, national uh, level. Which is, uh, if you, because if you ask. If you ask yourself, um, are, you know, or if people you know, ask you, are you Italian, are you German, are you French, well, what does that actually mean? So, um, so this is this is interesting. This is a, a view on the, the why the community becomes the important, um, let's say, uh, um, the important unit of size within. Uh, the transition uh, within the transition um, initiative. Okay, um, so energy, the energy trans, the energy transition is not just about using less oil, of course. Um, it's not just about using less plastic, um, and it's not just about thinking more carefully about sustainability. It's also about doing things in a different way. So it's about cultural change. And that is a very, very difficult thing. Because if we look at culture, if we look at some definitions of culture, um, we have definitions like this, the sum total of the knowledge, attitudes, and habitual behavior patterns shared and transmitted by members of a, of a society. Um, learned patterns of thought and behavior which are characteristic of a population or a society the attitudes the objectives and technical skills of society these are all sort of various varied definitions from different uh, different dictionaries um, but the you can see that you're going to have difficulty trying to get some change into the sum total of the knowledge um, and attitudes and habitual behaviors patterns okay so the transition initiative um, had its uh, let's say had its roots in the idea of um, looking at uh, let's say looking at human looking at human nature and working with human nature which means not trying to force people to change but working with how people naturally will um, gravitate or think about certain things and this is uh, this is a, a part of um, ecology which is called permaculture um, it's a, it has its roots in um, looking at agricultural systems but it can be extended to, to more general uh, more general ideas about integrating human activity with the surroundings okay and th now here here the emphasis is on natural surroundings and to creating efficient self-sustaining ecosystems 
if you look at this at a more in from a more social point of view, it's to do with um, creating self-sustaining uh, and resilient communities uh, by integrating different activities with working with the surroundings. Okay, so I'm being a little bit more general here, but the point is that the, the transition initiative will work with people rather than against people. Um, you're not forced because you can't force people. Uh, you can't force people to change. Um, so the perma permanent agriculture or permaculture, as it became known, was to do with. Um, uh, it came came to the fore in the 1970s uh, during the first oil crisis. So this is way way back. Some of us actually remember this probably. I do. Um, I remember the the, uh, the power cuts and um, and what have you. So um, so from a let's say a practical point of view on the. Um, uh, on the of actual activities, this is very, very much linked, uh, very much part of, um, let's say, agricultural thinking. So this was this is where this was born. Um, but the principles can actually be um, can actually be applied in a more general sense in a transition initiative within a community. So. Um, you're observing, you're not just uh, imposing, you're observing and then interacting. Um, you are channel capturing and channeling energy. Uh, now in, the ca in this case, this is literally, this is physically, <laughs> uh, physically storing energy in some way uh, so that you can um, get it, get at it later. You can use it for different things. Um, in a transition initiative, this is uh, to do with how energy is used in the uh, in the local communities. Um, you are, in this case, this was crops. You're, you were generating and harvesting the crops. Um, in the case of a transition initiative, you are um, you are, let's say, sowing the seeds of the ideas, and you are generating new ideas. You're harvest you are collecting the ideas and using them. And the whole thing is being self-regulated. Um, so it's not something external which is regulating. It's, a, it's an autonomous thing. So um, using and valuing renewable rate resources and services rather than producing waste. Okay, um, Integrating rather than separating because it's easy to separate it's not so easy to integrate um, prioritizing solutions which are you now this is very very out of step with our times because we live in the exponential world now and we expect uh, an idea and you want it to become fact or flesh almost immediately and this is something which we which many many which I think most people struggle with but the the point is this is that's slow but certain okay you're you're getting you're getting there um, diversity now there is a uh, there is an interesting point here because um, diversity for some people is a um, a source of anxiety, when in fact, for, from a systemic point of view, it's a, it's a potential source of richness because it, uh, it gives the system more um, op uh, more not opportunities but uh, more tools to be able to respond to a situation. Okay, now. This one is very curious because it says paying attention to border zones. Now you might think, what the hell does that mean? Uh, and actually, you might be thinking, what the hell does all of this mean? <laughs> okay, we are talking about transition initiative. We're talking about towns. We're talking about uh, communities. Um, the idea of when you have um, 
in this case, think of, a, of agriculture, where you have fields, okay? The borders of the fields, uh, which become, maybe they border woodland or where they, or where they border another type of field, um, quite often in the past were um, marked by uh, different types of either walls or fences or hedgerows, okay, so plants and stuff which were planted along the border, okay, um, and this is true in agriculture as it is also true in many, many technical endeavours, and that is that the most interesting stuff happens at the edges of the um, at the edges of the of the of, of the either the subjects or uh, at the edges of a of an area, and this is because the conditions that you have at the edge of something at the border are very very different to the conditions that you have in the centre. Uh, in the center it's essentially all uh, homogeneous and what have you and you can you can see this actually in um, uh, countries different countries across Europe in particular I'm, I'm focusing on Europe simply because it's a relatively contained geographical unit but it has a huge variety of cultures even within a country and what you find at the border, borders between one country and the next, you will find, quite often you will find shared dialects, um, shared cultural habits, even though there's a, a let's say, a, um, a political border running through uh, the, uh, the area. And these, this is simply because uh, these, these places which are at, at the edge of a of an area um, are in contact with different things. They're in contact with the external uh, the external wo uh, world. And the other aspect of this permaculture was to be able to respond uh, creatively to um, to changes which were happening. So, just two seconds. Just two seconds. Excuse me. Excuse me. Someone online. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. So while the permaculture permaculture is uh, concentrating on this systemic approach to land management, um, the transition initiative is promoting a systemic, collaborative, cooperative um, approach to uh, to people and between people and so let's say the, uh, the the it's not surprising that uh, the transition initiative has its roots in this type of thinking um, I have to say that when I first uh, I first heard about transition communities maybe uh, about 15 15 years ago 20 years ago and I hadn't really given it much thought uh, afterwards after I first heard about it um, and re-reading uh, these materials, I I got I felt that it was a little bit sort of let's say uh, woolly, a little bit sort of a little bit uh, wishy-washy, a little bit um, I don't know how, quite know how to how to describe it, but I think that's because it really is. Um, it's an approach which is putting people first, and so people are people are psychology. People are um, these type of people, are not economic units. They're not uh, machines. So this idea of the psychological and emotional aspects of a uh, of a situation within um, within a community become uh, these things become important and so we're not talking let's say we're not ta talking hard technical science here we're, talk we're, we're very much in the territory of uh, social uh, social interaction okay so um, key thing here is that people are encouraged to participate 
not just watch it. Um, and the whole thing here is to have to have as many people or to have people involved, such that um, people people feel that they own the solutions which come out um, because they've been part of it. They've been part of the process. So much of what we so much of what we see and what we experience these days is, um, let's say, uh, it's imposed and you're not necessarily uh, part of the decision making process and you're not really sure whether that's really what you wanted. Um, so uh, having people involved is absolutely vital to the success of any uh, any transition type initiative um, and uh, an interesting let's say an interesting psychological point here is that um, you need not just people who are able to communicate but you need people who are able to listen uh, and who people who are able to uh, who are able to ask the questions to get the uh, to get the, to get the best from uh, to get the best from the the, the the conversation. Okay, so why are communities are important? Now I couldn't help but do this um, because this guy just happened. <laughs> <laughs> He's just at the back of all of this, I think, um, because this is what many people feel, uh, the idea of alienation. You feel um, alienated from, uh, from your work, from your life, etc., etc., and so this is, uh, this is very much uh, what what our friend Carl um, identified uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, but the, the growth of cities um, and the, the expansion of cities has uh, led to... Uh, oh yeah. Okay, hold on a minute. I don't quite understand that whose balcony back guard guard yes it does yeah Carol. yes it does um, okay so yeah so the, the idea of um, uh, the idea of belonging to something okay belonging to uh, communities now interestingly I think the in the modern in our modern situation um, we actually have another type. We actually have other other types of communities, which are um, which are virtual, and people. Some people are parts are very active members of online communities in which they are meeting with um, uh, like-minded individuals who are who do who have the, who have similar interests and do similar things, and this can. Uh, break a lot of the uh, these let's say feelings of isolation. Uh, it can break these down. Um, but here we're actually talking about physical communities. So we're talking about let's say local geography. Um, and this is uh, this is very much linked to the idea of the community action to increase the social capital. What is the social capital? Well, this is the the um, local relationships, networks, help and friendships, all of these things which go up to go to make a um, uh, a living and working community. So, um, community is a characteristic of social. It's very much social psychology, social human development, um, because it was clear that if you're going to hunt mammoths and you're going to hunt big beasts and the world is a, is a big scary place full of things with sharp teeth, um, you need help. <laughs> you need other people to help you and you need to help them. And so this is obviously where the, the idea of the community uh, is... Um, 
was born. Um, and it is a concept, now I've noticed, uh, I've put here that it's a concept which, uh, it's a concept of belonging. You're part of it, you're part of something. Uh, which is why in the past ostracism from, a commu from the community was perhaps one of the most um, one of the most difficult things that people could uh, actually uh, actually deal with. Um, it cuts across any of these higher abstract concepts, concept of state or nationality, and it's it could be completely separate from separated from physical geography it doesn't necessarily have to be a um, as I said with the online communities for example um, it's a sense of belonging it's a sense of fellowship and this is William Morris the uh, the guy from uh, the guy who did the wallpaper uh, amongst other things um, and he t he used the word fellowship um, and it's being with other people um, and here this takes us back to uh, this takes us back to the um, let's say the uh, the more prim primordial situation with our hunter-gatherers so yeah um, so yeah people need need communities although maybe in modern life with our televisions and stuff we don't feel quite so uh, quite so benevolent towards our neighbors sometimes okay um, this is a, a quote from a transition initiative leader in a place called uh, Diffie in Wales um, so one of the awful, awful things about modern culture is separation and isolation We've broken down almost every social bond, so the only, one, the only bond, or the one bond left, is between parent and child. Uh, we've lost something and we don't know what it is. We try to fill it with food and alcohol and shopping, but it's never filled. What we've lost is our connection to our community, our place and nature. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a bit sort of... Um, uh, yeah, it's a bit... It's a bit, it's a bit tough, I think. <laughs> but it, it I think it describes describes the situ situation for many uh, for many people. So, um, having said that, so this is modern society. But modern society is is the big thing. What about things happening at a local? at a local level so um, while it may be that the modern society is on is a has a res relatively negative trajectory in terms of resource use in terms of waste in terms of how it treats individuals um, there are opportunities for improving uh, our quality of life um, and this can be partly done by um, look at standing back and identifying what we what what is important and transitioning is part of that. The idea of the transition transition initiative is uh, within you know the context of resource use etc etc is part of this. So recognizing that people can uh, improve the quality of life by forsaking many of the things. So coming back to that list, coming back to that table at the beginning, um, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm looking around me at the moment, I'm, uh, and there's just loads of stuff here, and I'm just thinking, well, you know, maybe uh, this is habit. Maybe this is, uh, I'm, I'm scared to, to change this, or maybe I just, I'm just too lazy, I don't know. But um, the point is that there are opportunities for improvement. Okay. So um, one of the uh, one of the things with the, the transition initiative is this head, heart, and hands uh, part, which is the idea that it's actually it's it's not a it's not an intellectual exercise. 
it uh, it is actually um, trying to change how you do things, trying to change the culture of how you do things. Um, it's it's not just about habit. It's also about um, engaging your head, engaging your heart, and engaging your hands, and getting the balance right between these three. So the head is acting on the best information that you can. Um, applying applying thinking to uh, collective uh, intelligence, uh, oh, sorry, applying the collective intelligence to finding better ways of doing things and better ways of living. Um, the heart is working with compassion, paying attention to the emotional, psychological aspects of what's, what's done. And the hands is actually doing, the hands is actually, uh, is actually doing stuff. Now, I just noticed a comment, um, but finally the problem is always money. Um, well, that's, I think that's true if you're expecting someone else to pay for it. Um, I think that uh, I think that the uh, the examples that you see of transition initiatives quite often they're re let's say they're relatively low relatively low cost if there is cost um, the cost is quite often someone's time and it becomes a question of whether uh, whether people feel committed enough to want to dedicate their time to helping someone else okay so um, some uh, sometimes some uh, some of the uh, the tangible uh, gains that could be uh, could be had or could be obtained so for example um, uh, these may or may not be uh, relevant um, you may have sort of tangible uh, uh, environmental uh, environmental gains such as uh, wa air and water quality, uh, noise reduction. Um, again, it does depend on what the initiative could what the initiative is. If the co if the local community is looking at uh, trying to uh, trying to reduce traffic in a in a in a neighbourhood, um, obviously you can't do that without engaging the uh, the city council or wherever it, wherever it is that you uh, that you that you live. But part of the part of the thing is to take the uh, is to take the um, take the proposal to the city council because it's something that you as a community want um, so looking at um, how does the community tran uh, do transition um, transition is working by taking um, uh, by taking ownership taking ownership of the uh, of the process um, it doesn't claim to have the answers or to have all of the answers but it does encourage people to try and find the answers for themselves based on what is what works for their community um, the idea or the model which is proposed is a model of uh, project support so the the transition it's the, let's say the transition initiative itself is helping to catalyze um, but the projects themselves are, um, are, are put forward and managed by the people who are interested in uh, seeing the result let's say um, so you may start with a small group of people uh, who are um, interested in it and they're looking into looking at the community they, they're spreading the word they're providing information raising awareness about uh, about things about what can be done um, picking up uh, ideas from the community about what sort of uh, what sort of things 
the community uh, would look for and in particular this uh, nowadays these uh, these activities uh, related to related back to climate change and peak oil um, and then at some point the, tra the transition launches and the uh, the transition initiative starts launches itself as a as a project within the community, but um, then starts to uh, seed um, then starts to seed the uh, different initiatives, which may be around transport, which may be about um, rely self reliance, may be about energy use, what have you. Okay. So the idea is that, um, okay, bye, thank you. Uh, the idea is that the, um, that through a number of projects, the, the, the community will start to move towards this, uh, towards this, this greater self-reliance. Um, you will have, or the, you may have uh, smaller subgroups which are dealing with particular projects, but this is really, let's say, the technical details of the project management of the thing. Um, so what sort of things do people do? Well, people uh, might do things like um, uh, local food production. Um, what about putting fruit trees in public spaces? Uh, community gardening, community composting. These are all activities which have been done in uh, in different cities across the world. Um, the idea of creating allotments. This is a this is a quite a common one, where people can uh, can grow fruit and vegetables. Now. An objection may be, oh well, I've never grown a vegetable in my life, I wouldn't know what to do. And some of the initiatives can be around transferring knowledge from people who do know how to do things to uh, to people who don't, people who want, but people who want to learn. Okay, um, and there are many examples. Uh, there are some nice examples of. Uh, old people, uh, pension, uh, pensioning, pensioners, who are showing or teaching young, well, uh, young people, uh, young adults, but also adolescents, how to uh, how to do gardening and uh, um, and how they can grow their own uh, fruit and vegetables. So there are many different uh, types of uh, types of activities that could be done. Um, so one of the one of the things here is the idea that the transition initiative, while it may be relatively new as an idea, um, it actually looks back to the past for many of the things which it does. So um, part of not wasting is the idea of recycling by. Um, not throwing things away but repairing things uh, so making do and mending um, thinking three times about whether you actually need that thing uh, that you want to buy so um, this is I think these guys I think this is the Amish community in the uh, in the US um, and these guys are famous for their ability to come together as a community someone needs a house and so they they, they just get together and they build it um, Relearning skills which have been forgotten, such so skills like knitting and and things like this. And again, this could be. Uh, there are examples of. There are many examples of um, uh, people within the community providing workshops to other people in the community to um, help them rediscover or re. Uh, um, Help, help them to learn uh, skills which once upon a time this was knitting for example was absolutely normal knitting crocheting sewing fixing your own uh, fixing your own clothes up to a up to a point was all relatively normal um, 
tradition community skills uh, is another one where, um, for example, the idea of uh, stone walling, dry stone. Dry stone walls are found all over Europe. Um, but the people who uh, the people who do this um, are relatively few, and they are relatively old. And so um, the idea of of continuity in the rural environment um, implies that uh, someone has to, will have to learn how to do this because otherwise it won't it won't happen. Um, and similarly, uh, coppicing is the uh, is the the act of um, managing woodlands such that you remove certain branches from trees. And this was done this was widely done during the Middle Ages as part of the management of woodland because it controls the growth of the trees. It makes the trees healthier but it also provided some uh, raw materials for for example for basket makers and for other other local crafts um, hedgerow management now this hedgerows are the uh, are the the um, it's the line it's typically the line of plants and woody trees and stuff which are along which mark the borders between fields um, and for a long time, these hedgerows were removed because they, there was a, a drive for industrialization. So uh, you're able to, to create larger fields and you're able to, um, uh, you're able to drive large tractors and make it economically, uh, economically viable. But the problem there is you're into monoculture and you're destroying the eco uh, you're drawing, destroying small ecosystems. If you remember, we talked about micro ecosystems. Um, we, you're destroying diversity, and so um, recognizing that agricultural land is not just about uh, wheat production or making <laughs> making something massively efficient by making lots and lots of it. Um, hedgerows actually are not simply collections of plants which have been left to to grow they are actually managed and you need to you need to take care of them just like a garden and in fact there were uh, there were in the past there were people who did this this was their their their, their job this was their um, their craft let's say um, so what about gar uh, gardening, organic gardening, re uh, renewed interest in crafts, um, and this is this is all thing. These are all things which can be um, which can be brought uh, brought back to the community. Okay, now let's just see how many things may. Yes, yeah, that, uh, that's a, now that is a very good point, Carmen. Uh, Maria Carmen, I imagine, um, because she's made this comment that handmade things make children reflect about the real value of goods, uh, added to the skills that are developed by them. Yeah, so um, it's like playing with Lego. Yeah, you you have motor skill, but beyond beyond just the cognitive aspect. It's the value of the thing itself. So rather than playing with your phone, you make something. Um, so you, you, you maybe you, you, you pick up a, a pair of needles and you knit something. You maybe you knit a hat or a pair of gloves or something. Okay, but it's the it's not just the object that you make. It's also the process that you go through. And this is um, for some people. Uh, for some people, this can be a uh, almost meditation. It becomes a. It can become a flow type of thing. So yeah. So lots of ideas about um, sort of bringing back, uh, bringing back human scale things. Okay. Um, an example from Wales, uh, which was the 
uh, it's related to the to the gardening because I think the gardening is is something which fits well with communities because uh, it's you know you can imagine sort of going out with people from other you know your neighbours or what have you and and doing something in a field involving growing things yeah um, and so what this what this transition initiative did was they were looking at growing fruit trees in uh, in communal gardens um, and so they got hold of the fruit trees but then people of course didn't really know what to do with them so they organized uh, they they got people in to teach them how to how to do grafting okay um, and this was uh, this was actually very successful and the this this group actually started to 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 tell uh, to show other people other groups how to how to do fruit tree grafting okay um i don't know whether anyone's ever been to wales but this is uh this is one of the castles in wales it's Carnarfon, which is quite a spectacular place okay um Okay, so uh, many of these uh, many of these things are um, uh, many of these activities that we may have seen as as children were um, sort of connected to historical memories of hard times. I mean, basically, when uh, when I grew <laughs> when I grew up back in the days of the dinosaurs. Um, there wasn't much stuff around. <laughs> okay, um, color, color television hadn't been invented, um, and the uh, the telephone, uh, the the idea of a smartphone was still in a Ray Bradbury book somewhere. So um, there was this idea of, um, let's say, making do. But this is that this is just reducing your expectations of what you want, maybe, in terms of material things. And fixing what you had around you. Now, interestingly, I think um, certainly in Europe there is a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of pressure coming uh, coming from the European Commission now to um, promote uh, to promote laws around um, the right to repair. So we are finally going to see the end of, um, it'll take a while, but we're finally going to see the end of um, uh, manufacturers deliberately sealing their, uh, their pieces, their, 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 uh, their goods or their products uh, to avoid uh, or so that the, the, the consumer has to uh, has to buy their repair service, so this is something which um, is is changing now. Okay, so fixing and restoring, um, and there's the a comment about the, the, these laws which protect our right to repair the things that we buy. So it's almost as if the thing that you have is not is not your own. Um, okay. Um, on a large scale, there is at least one example. Now, this is possibly a rather extreme example, but they are actually um, well advanced in producing a community renewable energy plant. It's a community-owned uh, energy plant, which is rather uh, rather advanced. Another has um, has dis has is is well on the way to. Um, working as a cooperative to bulk buy solar panels and then selling them and then to sell them uh, without uh, no profit. So um, other examples are uh, changes such as uh, well uh, things as small as launching upcycling workshops. So. For example, fixing common ha household things. Um, for many people, it's a mystery how these, how common everyday objects are put together, and whether you can even repair them or not. But there are people out there 
who know how to open a, a computer and change the RAM and do this and do that. So um, people have been organising uh, workshops so that where they, where they can exchange these uh, exchange this information. Um, and there is at least one example, and I don't think I don't think many people know this at all. There is at least one example of a local currency, which I found rather curious. Um, this is the Brixton pound. <laughs> okay, it's a picture of David ba David Bowie. Okay, um, and it's it's actually it actually exists. It actually exists in a part of London. Um, and the idea the idea is that um, you can sp you spend the one Brixton pound is the same as a, a normal pound, but you use these within the local area. And uh, shopkeepers will give you uh, discounts and all sorts of stuff. So it's it's to do with um, keeping the flow of of money uh, local. Um, another uh, another thing which is sort of connected. It's not truly a transition uh, initiative, but it is connected to the idea of local currency. Is the um, the Mpesa initiative in Kenya. Um, which basically completely short circuited the bank uh, the banks in the sense that uh, farmers were able to transfer money between themselves uh, and microfinance borrowers were able to receive money and repay loans using direct mobile phone payments without the bank um, I think uh, some things like this have now started to appear here. Um, okay, so the idea with this transition stuff is that we can't just wait. Um, the local problem, if we wait, the local problem is someone else's problem, but why would someone else act? Because they don't live locally. So this is where... Um, this is where the, uh, the this idea of, uh, of of action becomes very important, and it's important that it's uh, that the action is happening, that we that we take it that we take this action uh, now. Okay, so I'm just going to just going to conclude this. It's, it has been a bit rambling today. I think I'm not so not so happy about this this particular section, but. Um, the idea is that the the transitions the transition initiatives um, are very much to do with the community uh, each community is different each community has its own particular um, uh, particular uh, problems and it will have its own particular solutions um, there is no answer there is no simple answer um, so it's about creating answers which which work for for the local context it's constantly evolving um, and I would suggest if you're interested in it go and check it out on the on the web if you put in tran if you google transition initiative you will find lots of information about it um, it's an approach which is rooted in very, let's say, uh, very human things, which are the, the values and the principles of people and the community. Um, it's about uh, respecting resources, um, creating resilience, promoting um, involvement of people. Um, it's about balancing the needs of different uh, of different actors within the system. Um, and it's very much about learning so I think that's uh, that's a key thing here it's about learning and it's uh, also about fostering a positive uh, a positive vision uh, with creativity because it's too easy with these big things it's too easy to get very very um, get very negative get very uh, get very negative about them so it's important to uh, to to be to be able to be positive about changes
Okay, now there's lots and lots of lots and lots of references there. I will at some point actually let me see if I can just do that now. I don't know whether I can do this. Uh, da, 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 da. No, I'm not going to want to do that. Okay, I'll have to. Um, I'll send these around the. I'll send these around the group. Okay, so that's that's transitions, transition towns. Um, maybe a bit rambling, maybe not quite what I uh, what I wanted to do, but. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments about this, because the no 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 okay that's the one I want okay um, okay so so anybody got any comments about transition initiatives? I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there, um, but it's it's maybe not so um, maybe not so easy okay so what I'm going to do today uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at something about urban development um, so for the last 15 minutes here I think um, this is maybe a little bit more uh, seems difficult okay right seems difficult to start with this kind of transition in our area yeah Everything's pretty curious, but okay. Uh, might have big yes, yeah, okay, come on. I think you're right. Uh, but the thing, the thing, the thing is, yeah, the thing is that I think um, I suppose part of it is understanding what's uh, what's what's the space for 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 local action. So, for example, is is a uh, is a local is a is a local government um, is it how much interest does it have in developing for example um, allotments for for people you know for, for people to grow fruit trees and uh, and vegetables and stuff I mean you're not you're not talking about overt let's say overt political action here you're talking about so very practical things because the the or you know the sorts of uh, benefits you get from maybe growing some veg apart from the vegetables themselves. It's as uh, Maria Karma, Karma said before. It's the, actually the act, it's the act of doing something, um, and the, as we know, the idea of, of growing stuff can be very uh, can be very powerful for um, for for uh, as a psychological thing, and also for uh, teaching younger people about. Um, uh, you know where where things come from. We've lost the sense of community, so on that is going to be really hard. Yeah, again, I think that's again, I think that's particularly true if you live in uh, if you live in maybe a city, maybe in a village, it's a bit easier. Um, but it's this idea of community which is the which is the the problem because it's um, it's, ha it's it's something which has been which has been lost doesn't mean to say it couldn't be gained again though it doesn't mean to say that it couldn't be uh, re uh, re um, reignited because in in many in many cities uh, although you may not have a village you do have the the quarter el quartier um, but also, again, being really clear that this is not about uh, this is not about overturning anything, other than uh, just looking at how the how the community can work together to make the community make the community space more positive, better for everybody. Okay, so. If you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to start and uh, since we start with spoiler. 
Yeah, okay, so for instance, we started with supporting the fair trade market with zero kilometers of products, but it's so complicated to, to maintain it in the, long in the long term. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, maybe that's a big, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a big, um, uh, maybe that's a big, a big thing to start with because it involves it involves um, it involves finance it involves uh, monitoring um, uh, money and a whole pile of stuff so it, it it could be that could be potentially difficult to start off with um, the question would be did you get any did you get any help from people who'd already done this um, could you learn from someone else's someone else's experience um, and also is there desire within the community for it to uh, for it to to um, to continue and again we also have to remember I think that not everybody is going to be interested in everything so uh, some things will by their nature have uh, have limits okay so um, with that said just going to take some take a few minutes to just look at some stuff about um, uh, urban stuff now for some reason I don't know why there's actually <laughs> there's actually quite a lot of references to places in Spain in this uh, in this collection of slides uh, which we will see in a minute um, but coming back to the idea of uh, cities, sustainable cities and climate change, um, it's quite clear that climate in cities uh, is extremely important because most people in the world live in cities. Um, and this is not going to change. If anything, it's going to get, it's going to uh, accelerate. Um, um, now, the statistic here is that urban areas occupy less than 3% of the land area on the planet. Um, but as you can see from the picture, this looks like no natural landscape whatsoever. Um, and there are different ways of, uh, there are different scales of looking at this. Um, and to be honest with you, I find all of this stuff really quite fascinating, how people, how people learn how to think about uh, about this, what we see is we see skyscrapers. I think this is, this could be New York. I'm not sure. We see skyscrapers. We see lights. We see the city lights. We see the roads. We see pe busy people. We don't see. We don't really necessarily think about this as an environment. Um, it's so highly modified. It's so highly different to uh, to anything in nature so we have different scales so we can think of um, the street scale which is obviously it is what it is it's the the detail we can think of the city scale which is the the, the, the scale of maybe a, an area or a, a whole city itself um, and a regional scale and this this becomes important for the uh, the, the huge conurbations. So I'm thinking um, places like Tokyo, uh, Seoul, um, mega cities, uh, large cities, uh, Mexico City, uh, Paris, London, um, New York, these Los Angeles, these places which are so huge. Dallas, which is one of the it doesn't have, have a, a tremendous number of people, but it's one of the largest cities in the world in terms of area. Um, there's one place I read last week, uh, a city in China, which I can't remember how many millions of people it has, um, but the urban environment around the city was is as big as Austria, the country, which I, I just can't, I can't get my head around that. Anyway... Okay, so um, not surprisingly, cities create their own climates um, because they are just so highly modified. Now, this is Vancouver, 
Um, and Vancouver originally didn't look like this at all, of course, because there weren't all of these high-rise high buildings. And the fact that we put there are high-rise buildings all over the place, this completely changes uh, a number of um, a number of factors to do with how the city exchanges energy with its environment. So if we think, if we remember that uh, climate is to do with how an area, a geographical area, is exchanging uh, energy with uh, with the rest of the the Earth system. Um, it's quite clear that this has a <laughs> this will have a very particular uh, a very particular way of um, exchanging this energy. So, uh, thinking about these uh, these areas, and I think any major city you can imagine uh, has this has this type of uh, this type of thing. So, as it grows, it's using more space. It's using more resources. The wind here. Why do you say? Why do you use the? Uh, ah, uh, okay, right. Uh, because they are different. Because each each city has its own climate. Therefore, many cities have many climates. Okay, so um, that's why it's a plural. Okay. So uh, you can imagine, for example the way these buildings relate to the where to how the sun moves in the sky the wind no i would never even you would never maybe even thought of the wind currents this is a bay if you've ever been to vancouver it's uh, on vancouver bay which is uh, really quite a phenomenal uh, a phenomenal location um, in terms of natural location, you have high mountains behind, and then you have this uh, this bay with lots and lots of inlets, and uh, it's very protected, and it's very um, let's say it's a very calm environment. Um, but the city itself has uh, these these skyscrapers, these buildings have completely altered the air currents. Um, they also alter how the sunlight reaches uh, reaches the ground because of course you can imagine that if you're down here you're going to be in um, uh, you're going to be in in shadow a lot of the time and all of this influences the processes of energy exchange okay um, and so you can have all sorts of microclimates within an urban environment and I thought I found this rather interesting because we tend to think oh yeah this the city will be warmer but it does depend on where you are and it does depend on what type of city you're in so um, looking at these two uh, this is Piazza del Popolo in Rome and this is Las Ramblas in Barcelona um, and you can see that this type of broad open space is going to have a very different energy exchange compared to uh, compared to this. I think this must be autumn time, but this leafy uh, tree lined uh, tree lined street, which when the trees are completely out, uh, completely open, um, is very much in the shade. Um, this is at least how I remember it. So, okay, I'm looking at the time now, and I think uh, I think I'm going to stop there because I think it's uh, this is a good place to to, to stop. So, um, we're going to next time we'll finish looking at uh, urban environments, and we'll pick up on. Let's just see. We will pick up. We will pick up on the idea of interconnectivity. Okay. Anybody? Anybody got any questions? Anybody got any questions or comments? I'll just leave it on this one. I wonder what's happened to my video here. Can't get the video to work. Boop. Okay. 
Any any questions? Nope. 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 No questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I apologise for the. <laughs> I got a little bit lost with the tra with the transition stuff. But please do do follow it up. I'll send I'll send uh, I'll send the links to uh, Agnes and she can forward them to forward, forward them to you. Um, it, it is well worth looking at. Um, and I think you know there's there's lots of food for thought there. Okay, so thank you everybody. Thank you for your um, measurable patience. Thank you everyone. I stopped the recording now. Okay, right. Okay, thank you, Agnesa. Thank Grazie. you. Okay.